Okay, let's get started here. Um, welcome everybody. I think there are gonna be some people coming in today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the third installment of our speaker series on uh, disability in uh, German language, literature and culture. Today, we have a special guest uh, and a friend of mine, Alec Cattell from Texas Tech University, and I'm really, really happy to, uh, to have him here. Uh, this course looks at uh, um, representations of disability in German literature and culture, as the title says. Um, but what it really also does, it, uh, it looks at how our notions of normativity and able-bodiedness actually construct the other and ourselves in a, in a, uh, in a move where we use uh, these minority identities to position ourselves. So, in a sense, the seminar is about disability, but in another sense, uh, the course is very, very much about normativity and uh, how normativity constructs its own identity via the other, akin to other minority discourses. And uh, disability has been described uh, as the ultimate um, minority discourse, uh, an identity that overshadows all other identities. So since it is a minority discourse, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, one of the other minority minorities whose land we're sitting on. As you all know, uh, Waterloo, Kitchener, Cambridge, the campuses of the University of Waterloo are situated on the Haldeman track. This is land that was granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of Grand Rivers in 1784, and uh, that that um, uh, that land grant still says said still stands. Sorry, I'm a little bit off today. So we are within the territory of the neutral Ashinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples, and uh, we really need to acknowledge that we we are living on this, and that we are also still very much indebted as as um, as scholars, as students, uh, to acknowledging that, but also to writing the historical wrong. Okay, um, uh, let's get to our topic. Uh, we have a couple of seminar members who would like to introduce Alec. And I'll turn over to Alec now um, to direct the rest of the seminar. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all here. I'm so glad we can meet in this space together. I would have liked to come to you in person. Maybe I'll get to do that sometime. The last time I was in Waterloo was April 2014 for my dissertation uh, defense. And again, I hope to come back someday. Those who are going to introduce me, would you like to um, unmute and go for that now? Yes, we would like to do that. Um, okay, a special welcome to you, Alec, from our side as well. Um, so we want to start by introducing you to everyone in attendance today. So Alec is currently working as the Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning and Professional Development Center at Texas Tech University, and also directs the Ethics in Teaching and Learning program for faculty. As he said, Alec earned his bachelor's and master's degrees as well as his PhD in German from the University of Waterloo. And in 2014, he wrote his PhD thesis on disability in German post-World War I dramas, and among them Ernst Toller's Der Deutsche Hinkemann, which, as you know, we also discussed in a previous session of our seminar with Michael. Um, furthermore, Alex studied applied linguistics and earned the certificate in university teaching at the Center for Teaching Excellence. He's published scholarly work on representations, aesthetics, and rhetorics of disability in German literature, as well as curriculum design and technology in language pedagogy, and focusing on sustainable development in language education. He very recently co-published a book chapter on sustainability in German curricula. 
So in today's session, Alec will discuss Gertrud Kolmar's Susanna with us. And for this purpose, Peter and I have prepared a set of questions and topics to guide us through our discussion. Yeah, um, welcome from me as well. And I will just read out the questions, but I think Alec has them integrated as well in his presentation. Uh, I will just read them out as a starter. Um, so to get everyone thinking about it. Um, as Sandra said, we are going to talk about Gertrud Kolmar's Susanna. And um, we have four questions. So the first question is on the topic of disability and the portrayal of women. Um, how does Susanna's disability affect her role as a woman in society, for example, in terms of being subjected to uh, patriarchal structures? Um, the second question deals with the taboo of disabled people uh, acting out sexuality and romantic relationships in general. Um, so would you say Susanna's disability facilitates her being labeled as a whore by Frau Rubin? And um, the third question is um, that the narrator and some other characters in the story describe Susanna as inhuman and frightening. And our question is that what effect does the narrator's portrayal of Susanna have on the reader's perception of the narrator itself? Um, and last but not least, uh, our fourth question is that the story reveals um, that this is, that Susanna's death is followed by the death of Frau Rubin. And to what extent do the narrator's portrayals of the two deaths differ? And what does this imply for her stance on disability? Thank you, Sandra and Peter. Um, I really appreciated uh, corresponding with you by email. And I really liked the questions that you posed. They're very thoughtful, and we're going to return to them uh, throughout the presentation today. I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen. I'm kind of bad at this, so give me a moment. <laughs> okay, can everyone see my title slide? Okay. Great. Okay, so again, we're talking today um, about Gertrud Komas Susanne. And before we jump in to talk about this text, uh, it's one that really left an impression on me and I continue to think about it. I wanted to ask you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. We have some students who are taking a, a university course. We have some community members who are interested in German culture and literature. Just share maybe your name and what brings you to the session today as well as the title of a text about disability, what I call a disability text. Something that you've watched or read um, or seen that left an impression on you and has shaped your thinking about disability. I think one of the earliest ones for me was uh, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, Tiny Tim. So if you have a similar text in mind that comes to mind, if you feel free, feel free to share it in the chat. Actually, I can see everyone's name. <laughs> so maybe just sharing uh, what brings you to the session and your disability text. Shall we just start in? Sure, you can feel free to speak out or you can type it in the chat. So. Uh, oh, I see. Yes, yes. That's okay. You can share orally as well. All right. Well, um, as you see, my name is Michael Eben. I did uh, quite a bit of research on Colmar in the 80s. So <laughs> this is a long time ago, and I haven't read uh, any of her material, all of which I had read at one time, but uh, for a long, long time. So I was just very pleased and interested to see you bringing up uh, a topic involving Colmar because I was much touched by her, her biography, if you will. I, I don't have a connection to the disability text and theme, but I, I'm just here with interest as, as a member of, uh, now retired from the department at U of T and at uh, Upper Canada College, uh, who was interested in Colma. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here and uh, what, a, what a wonderful connection. So 
we're interested to hear um, hear your insights as well through the discussion. Uh, Alec, if I may jump in there. Yes. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for, for, for providing that. Uh, yeah, th that's exactly part of the point of the course is that usually we do not read uh, literary text from a disability, a critical disability studies perspective. So for me, it was it was important to take uh, to take text, and we've we've looked at uh, canonic texts, including including um, uh, fairy tales from the Grimm brothers. That, that we then uh, read under a different and, and specific uh, lens to see how this, uh, how conceptualizations of, uh, of uh, disability have developed over the time within German culture and German language. I'm reading in the chat here. <clears throat> it's great to meet all of you. This is uh, very exciting. Some of the examples that you're sharing, um, in particular, Catching My Eye, A Quiet Place. That's a lovely, a lovely film, um, and especially um, using some of the tools that you're getting in this course, I can imagine how that, how they can help us to have um, a deeper reading of, of, of movies like this, The Untouchables as well, Avatar, mm -hmm. and books, rules, Heidi, yes, yes indeed. Okay, well, thank you. That, that We're just practicing using the chat because we're going to use it a lot. Um, so as we move forward here, um, in literary studies, we ask big questions about text. And again, text can be very understood very broadly. Um, we're thinking about an Erzählung here, Susanna. So we come to it with the typical questions we might ask. When was it written? When was it published? Who wrote it? What is represented? How is it represented? And why is this important? So for me, those are just three central questions. What are we? What is here? How is it presented? And why should we why should we care about that? The so what question. This is a question I learned to ask during my time at Waterloo. <laughs> yes, indeed. So with that, I, I just wanted to um, mention briefly, then I'll turn it over to our presenter um, about the author. But just briefly to answer these questions, it was written in 1939, 1940, only published in 1959, because the author, Gertrud Kete, Kotzisna, Kotzisna, um, pen name Gertrude Colmar uh, was killed by the Nazis in 1943. Um, and so that's why it came out uh, so much later. But this is the last piece that we have from her that she wrote. Um, so that's significant. I'd like to turn it over now to, um, to our presenter, uh, Laura Bretz. And I will, um, if you are okay with that, I can go ahead and share the slides that you have, Laura. Yes, sure. Um, I just noticed uh, I prepared my presentation in German. I just wanted to ask if that is okay, because I can also just like um, explain it in English to you if you prefer, if you would otherwise. Von mir mind. aus, versteht jeder hier Deutsch? Okay. So is German okay? Did I get that right? Bitte schön. Okay, um, gut. Uh, ja, wie Alex schon uh, erwähnt hat, ich uh, habe die Autorenpräsentation für unseren heutigen Text Susanna vorbereitet. Um, ja, es ist der letzte Text, der, uh, den sie zu Lebzeiten geschrieben hat und die meisten ihrer Werke wurden tatsächlich erst posthum veröffentlicht. Deswegen gehe ich direkt mal auf Seite 2 um, und erzähle einfach ein paar. Können wir eine Seite weitergehen? <lacht> Danke. Um, und erzähle einfach was zu den wichtigsten Eckdaten ähm, von Gertrud Kolmar. Ähm, ihr Pseudonym, äh, da sie ja eigentlich als Gertrud Kete Tschutziesner am 10. Dezember 1894 in Berlin geboren war, setzt sich aus äh, der Herkunft ihrer polnischen Vorfahren väterlicherseits zusammen. Tschutziesen war nämlich eine Stadt in der preußischen Provinz Posen, die 1878 in Kolmar umbenannt wurde. Und äh, so kam sie dann auf äh, ihr Pseudonym Gertrud Kolmar. Sie wird heute als eine der wichtigsten Autorinnen neben Nelly Sachs oder Else Lasker Schüler ähm, betrachtet, blieb in der ähm, literaturhistorischen Sicht jedoch lange unterbeachtet und unbeachtet und genoss nicht den gleichen Rang wie andere deutsch-jüdische Autor, deutsch Autorinnen wie Rose Ausländer oder Hilde Domin. 
Ähm, das hat sich in den letzten Jahren Gott sei Dank geändert ähm, und gleichzeitig äh, haben doch Zeitgenossen, darunter Nelly Sack selbst äh, oder Jakob Dikar oder auch ihr Cousin Walter Benjamin, ihr großes lyrisches Talent angepriesen. Sie selbst sah sich auch vor allem als jüdische Lyrikerin und weniger als Autorin und hatte eine aktive Schaffenszeit von rund 21 Jahren, von ihrer ersten Veröffentlichung 1917 bis zur letzten 1938. Und auch ihr überliefertes Werk besteht hauptsächlich aus Gedichten und weniger aus drei Theaterstücken und Kurzgeschichten, zu denen ähm, Susanna zählt. Ähm, ja, ihren Tod fand sie sehr tragisch ähm, im KZ Auschwitz, vermutlich Anfang März 1943. Man kennt das genaue Datum nicht, jedoch ist offiziell datiert der 2.3.1943. Und ihr Öffre beschäftigt sich weitgehend mit Themen weiblicher Identität, der Dichotomie zwischen Natur und Gesellschaft sowie dem Leiden des jüdischen Volkes. Äh, auf der, können wir auf die nächste Seite gehen, bitte? Dankeschön. Das Leben der Autorin war sehr bewegt. Sie wurde als Älteste von vier Geschwistern in eine großbürgerliche Familie in Berlin-Westend geboren, wo sie auch die meiste Zeit ihres Lebens verbracht hat. Ähm, obwohl die Familie zwar jüdischen Ursprungs war, ähm, war sie kulturell sehr aufgeschlossen und hat die traditionellen jüdischen Praktiken ähm, nicht fortgeführt bzw. nicht praktiziert. Und das liegt hauptsächlich wohl an ihrem Vater ähm, Ludwig Schurziesner, der ein sehr erfolgreicher Rechtsanwalt und späterer Justizrat war. Äh, zudem hatte Gertrud Vollmer ein sehr, sehr inniges Verhältnis, obwohl er sehr absorbiert von seinem Beruf war. Äh, er war zudem glühender Verteidiger der Monarchie und kann als ähm, Idealbild oder Repräsentant des liberal gebildeten preußisch-jüdischen Bürgertums gesehen werden. Ein eher schwieriges Verhältnis hatte Kolmer dann zu ihrer Mutter Elise, von der fühlte sie sich oft unverstanden und nicht wahrgenommen und zusammen mit dem fehlenden Verständnis ihrer Mutter und der fehlenden Aufmerksamkeit ihres Vaters äh, führte das dann zu einem schwierigen Verhältnis zu sich selbst als heranwachsende junge Frau und sowie zu einer inneren Zerrissenheit zwischen jüdischen Glauben und der Assimilation der Familie in die westliche und vor allem preußische Kultur zu der Zeit und zu einem schwankenden Selbstwertgefühl, was sich später sehr stark vor allem in frühen Werken auch wieder zeichnen sollte. Ähm, als Teil der Groß des Großbürgertums noch sie außerdem eine sehr umfangreiche Ausbildung, zunächst auf einer höheren Mädchenschule und später auf einer wirtschaftlichen Frauenschule in Leipzig ab 1911. Und hinzu kamen mehrere Sprach- und Studienreisen äh, in Frankreich, in Dijon und Paris und Leipzig, Hamburg und Berlin, währenddessen sie auch meistens durchgehend als Erzieherin arbeitete, in Hamburg unter anderem an einer Taubstummenschule. Sie war darüber hinaus auch sehr sprachbegabt. Sie sprach mehrere Sprachen, darunter Tschechisch, Französisch, Englisch, Russisch, Flämisch, später auch Hebräisch und schloss ähm, 1917, 18 ihr Sprachdiplom für die Sprachen Französisch und Englisch ab, damit sie als Lehrerin arbeiten konnte. Ähm, Entsprechend arbeitet sie dann während des Ersten Weltkrieges als Dolmetscherin und Zensorin im Kriegsgefangenenlager Döberlitz in Berlin. Da erschien auch ihr erster Gedichtband unter dem Namen Gedichte, ähm, unter ihrem Pseudonym entsprechend. Äh, und ein Jahr vorher pflegte sie zudem eine ähm, tragische Liebesbeziehung zu dem Offizier Karl Jodel. Ähm, die endete allerdings mit einer Abtreibung, zu der sie von ihren Eltern genötigt wurde und die pflichtbewusste und sehr traditionsbewusste Kolmar hatte Angst, dass sie mit ihrer ähm, Schwangerschaft und ihrem, ihrer unverheirateten Lebensweise äh, die Karriere des Vaters und das Ansehen der Familie ruinieren könnte. Sie litt Zeit ihres Lebens unter den Folgen ähm, dieser Abtreibung, mehr auf psychischer Seite und hat auch nie geheiratet, weil sie das nie verbinden konnte. Ähm, Nachdem sie einige Jahre dann in der Öffentlichkeit als Autorin auch ähm, bekannt war, hat sie sich 1928 zurück äh, zur Familie gezogen, weil ihre Mutter sehr stark erkrankt ist, ähm, hat dort dann den, für das, die Rolle des Familienoberhaupts übernommen und sich aus der Öffentlichkeit nahezu völlig zurückgezogen. Ähm, in dem damaligen Anwesen Finkenkrug erlebte sie doch eine sehr kreative Schaffenszeit und es gilt auch als, oder sie bezeichnet es als die glücklichste Zeit ihres Schaffens und es wurden vereinzelt auch Gedichte in Literatur, Zeitschriften und Anthologien veröffentlicht. Ähm, genau, 1900. 33 dann, ähm, als es für Juden in Deutschland immer schwieriger wurde und immer mehr Restriktionen kamen, flohen ihre Geschwister aus Deutschland, während sie sich ähm, dazu entschied, bei ihrem kranken Vater zu bleiben und ihn zu pflegen. 
Ähm, <lacht> zu dieser Zeit erschien dann auch äh, ihr Gedichtband Preußische Wappen. Das war der zweite, den sie je veröffentlicht hat, 1934, der sogar den Boykott des Verlages durch den Börsenverein ähm, Deutsche, des Deutschen Buchhandels nach sich zog. Und dann folgte auch ein Pseudonymverbot 1936, das ihr verboten hat, unter ihrem Pseudonym weiterhin zu veröffentlichen. Ähm, die nächsten Jahre waren äh, sehr schwierig für Kolmer und auch ihren Vater, denn sie mussten nach einem kurzen Gefängnisaufenthalt des Vaters ihr Haus in Berlin ähm, in Finkenkrug in Spandau verkaufen und wurden äh, zwangsweise in ein Judenhaus in Berlin-Schöneberg untergebracht, wo Kolmer dann auch 19, ab 1941 zur Zwangsarbeit in der Rüstungsindustrie verpflichtet wurde. Und dort schrieb sie trotz ihrer 13-stündigen Schichten nachts weiter in ihrer Lyrik und fing an, auf Hebräisch äh, zu schreiben und auch Konversationen zu betreiben. Weil man geht davon aus, dass sie eine Flucht nach Israel geplant, geplant hatte. Jedoch sollte sie das nie verwirklichen können. 1942, also nur ein Jahr später, wurde ihr 80-jähriger Vater ins Ghetto Theresienstadt verschleppt, wo er dann am 13.02.1943 ermordet wurde. Das hat Kolmann nicht mehr erfahren, weil sie selbst am 27.02. während der sogenannten Fabrikaktion verhaftet wurde und dann am 2.3. und 32. Osttransport im Rahmen der Entlösung nach Auschwitz äh, gebracht wurde und äh, auch direkt nach der Aus Ankunft und Ausmusterung äh, in der Gaskammer ermordet. Ähm, ihre wichtigsten Werke sind die, vor allem die, die sie zu Lebzeiten herausgegeben hat, Gedichte, preußische Wappen und die Frau und die Tiere, sowie ihre beiden Prosa-Texte, eine jüdische Mutter und Susanna. Ähm, Gerade ihr erster Gedichtband Gedichte befasst sich hauptsächlich mit ihrem ambivalenten Verhältnis zu sich selbst, dem Gefühl innerer Zerrissenheit und in einem schwierigen Verhältnis zu weiblicher Identität. Und es geht viel um Selbstfindung und der Erkundung bzw. Konstituierung des eigenen Ichs als Motiv. Hinzu kommt bei allen ihren Werken auch die stetige Zerrissenheit zwischen den erlebten antisemitischen Anfeindungen seit der Weimarer Republik und der Assimilation der Familie an die preußischen Werte und an das äh, jüdisch-preußische Bürgertum. Äh, sie hat sich seit ihres Lebens sehr stark mit der Mystik des fernen Ostens äh, befasst und damit auch mit dem Judentum selbst. Und ein wichtiger Punkt ihrer äh, Lyrik und auch in ihren beiden Prosa-Texten war die Ausgrenzung und Isolation des äh, jüdischen Volkes. Äh, aufgrund ihrer Abtreibung und der unglücklichen Liebe zu Karl Jodl war jedoch auch ein sehr, sehr starkes Thema in ihrer Lyrik die ungestellte Liebessehnsucht, die wir auch in Susanna wiederfinden, sowie die Sehnsucht nach dem ungeborenen Kind, das vor allem in der Lyrik stärker zum Tragen kommt. Später in äh, ihrem letzten Werk steht dann auch die Dichotomie zwischen der heilsamen Natur und Einheit zwischen Natur und Tieren gegen die destruktive Gesellschaft, was sich dann in die Frauen und die Tiere äh, ihrem letzt veröffentlichten Band auch wiederfindet. Ähm, Gertrud Kolmer selber ist sehr schwierig einzuordnen in literaturhistorischen Kontext, da sie vor allem von ihrer eigenen Biografie und ihrem eigenen Werdegang sehr geprägt und gezeichnet ist und eher daran ihr lyrisches Schaffen auch orientiert. Also es, es fiel mir sehr schwer, überhaupt was zu finden, wie man sie einordnen konnte, ähm, da eben sie sich aktiv auch einfach geweigert hatte, Sachen wie dem wilhelminischen Bildungsideal in ihrer Literatur und auch in ihrer Lyrik zu entsprechen. Und hauptsächlich spiegelt ihre ganze Biografie ähm, sich in ihren Werken wider. Ähm, das war es erstmal soweit zu mir. Ähm, ich hoffe, ich hatte eigentlich einige Diskussionsfragen vorbereitet. Ich weiß nicht, ob wir die jetzt machen oder nach dem Vortrag. Aber falls wir die Zeit haben, würde ich gerne ein bisschen darüber diskutieren, welche Themen und Leitmotive man in Susanna finden kann, die vielleicht ähm, Kolmas eigene Ambivalenz zum Judentum und der Zeit, in der die Erzählung geschrieben wurde, äh, finden kann und welche Rolle Disability auch in der Erzählung spielt, beziehungsweise was die eigentliche Behinderung hier ist und wofür sie stehen kann. Ähm, Genau, und die dritte Frage zielt dann auch nochmal auf den inneren Konflikt Kolmas zwischen eigener Erziehung und Tätigkeit als Dichterin ab. Danke, Laura, für diesen äh, Überblick über Kolmar. Wenn es okay ist, können wir die für, für das Ende äh, aufheben. Und ich nach, nach äh, unserer Diskussion können wir vielleicht darauf zurückkommen, wenn das okay ist. Oder ich bin offen, wenn wir die jetzt besprechen wollen. Okay. Gut, dann heben wir sie auf. Um, again, just 
listening to to Lauka's presentation about Kumar's life, I, I think that um, again, this was a very intelligent person, a creative person, a kind person, a person of integrity. And those questions that you asked at the end, what, uh, how she put this into her into her oeuvre, I think that's a really important connection to keep in mind. And we'll, we will come back to them. Um, do, do, do. So again, um, it has been mentioned in her uh, oeuvre, there are themes that have been explored. Um, femininity, um, being Jewish, and this experience of, of being othered. Um, today, we're going to take a slightly different lens, uh, a disability studies lens, to see if we can um, look at it and we can consider the intersections between disability um, and ethnic or religious identity and gender, of course, as we go along. So what I'm going to do now, kind of in um, rapid order, we're going to go through um, some quotes from the book. And we're going to, I'm going to ask you to share in the chat as we go along, just as they come to you, pop them in the chat. You've be recently been reviewing um, the social model of disability in comparison to the medical model. So some of that, uh, um, that, that theoretical construct. Earlier in the semester, you looked also at disability tropes and myths that we see in literature, killer cure, um, disability as pathology, disability as a sign of good, disability as a sign of evil, uh, these tropes that we're so familiar with. So maybe you can focus in on a word or a phrase in some of these quotes and kind of identify what, um, what model is at play here or what, uh, what trope can we identify? And then we'll, we'll come to some discussion. So again, please share in the chat um, what disability tropes and myths or um, what model of disability can you detect in these statements taken from the text uh, in, from the mouth of Justizrat Fordon, who is Susanna's um, legal guardian. Sie leidet nicht. Sie ist nur ein Kind, ein heiteres, gutherziges Kind. Sie will schöne Kleider, sie liebt auch Schmuck. In diesem ist sie ein Weib. Sie verstehen, dass Susanne niemals heiraten darf. Picking up on light, Leiden, anything come to mind? Mm -hmm. Infantilization, yep, through which he's further othered. This happens throughout the text. Pity, object of pity, mm -hmm. charity. Isolation, absolutely. She's kept away from society for most parts. Mm -hmm. And innocence, okay. So again, not fully, not fully the, the adult that she is. She's kind of infantilized, has this innocence about her. The last two comments here in particular have to do with gender as well. And here we go, depicting her as a woman. That she's allowed to like clothing and jeweler, but she's not allowed to marry. But only the woman's role, so she's kind of robbed of uh, that part of human experience. Nur, not complete. And there is expectation. Again, as Peter says, that there would be, she would be in pain by saying, sie leidet nicht. So kind of acknowledging that that assumption is in the background. Someone has a disability, intellectual disability, they must be suffering. Almost a little bit of a disability drift going on there as well. Okay, again, with, with gender here, this connects with, um, with the question that was raised earlier. Um, how does Susanna's disability affect her role as a woman in society um, in, in terms of being subjected to patriarchal structures. I think we touched on it here in the chat already. But someone, uh, I think it's Laura, again, stuck in the dichotomy between a woman as a sexual being and as a child that is less than a fully developed human and needs constant supervision and protection. So again, 
and maybe especially because she's a woman. Um, but again, she is stuck between these, uh, these dichotomous positions. Yeah. Or it could be a double, double oppression. Okay, here we're gonna do, do again some more quotes in rapid succession here. These are from the Erzählerin, who is the um, Erzählerin for Susanna, who's been brought in. So what, what models of disability, what tropes and myths do we de um, detect in these statements by the, by the narrator? Ich hatte mir meine Aufgabe schwieriger vorgestellt. Ich hatte ein launenhaftes, leicht erregbares Wesen erwartet, mit Ablehnung und Verstocktheit zu kämpfen gedacht. Nun sollte ich nur ein erwachsenes, freundliches Kind behüten. Und ich zweifelte an dem Scharfblick des alten Vormunds und verwarf seine Meinung, dass die Weise keiner menschlichen Freude bedür Freunde bedürfe. Schön war es im Vorkommen, die zarte Haut, die Tönung von altem Elfenbein, die runde Stirn unter schwarzem Haar, die feine und gerade Nase. Dunkel und Lachen strahlten die Augen. Sie hat ein sehr tiefes Blau, das sah ich doch erst in den nächsten Tagen. Ihr Mund und die Stimme ihres Mundes waren reizend wie ihre Gestalt. Alles an ihr war an und süß. And this is when they're in, uh, in conversation about a Fischadler. And she says, der Fischadler ist nicht so groß, das sind deine Träume, sagte ich und vergaß, dass ich ihr auch nicht im Scherz widerspreche, dass ich nicht uh, zu ihr, dass ich zu ihr nicht reden durfte, wie sonst mit Menschen. Sie furchte dann gleich die Stirn und zuckte die Brauen, die immer, wenn ihr Verstand in die Enge getrieben ward und in ihren Augen flackerte als ein gehetztes Tier. And finally, ihr Gesicht schloss sich zu, schied sich gleichsam von mir, war wirklich nicht mehr eines Menschen. Ich spürte zum ersten Mal leise den Schauder, der uns vor Geisteskranken befällt. We're going to come back to some of these, these words that you see in, in these quotes um, after we look at the last set of quotes here. Yes, someone shares their dehumanization being a threat. Very similar um, are the narrator's observations of how people are perceiving Susanna and the things that they say about her. So for example, um, when they're on a walk, the sonderlichste war, dass die Männer Susanna grüßten. Manche bewundern, Andere Augenblitzern und frech, einige fast ernst und voll Mitleid. Die Frauen jedoch grüßten selten und viele blickten mich neugierig an und zielten mit dünnem Hohn, mit Ablehnung auf Susanna, die ihre, mit der es nun schlimmer wurde, so dass man ihr vorsichtshalber eine Wertung empfiehlt. Das war gut und gerechte Sache, denn dieses Geschöpf tat das Böse, dass jede Frau, die es traf, verwaschen und reizlos wurde. Mhm. Gothic romanticization. Another quote here, she's going to shop in this uh, in Abramovich Laden and is having a conversation with the, with the woman working there. Sehen Sie, die Stimme schien minder scharf, ihr Auge weniger stechend. Das ist so ein kluger Junge, so ein gebenchter Junge, wie der lernt. Und das Unglück. Sie haben es ja auch mit ihrem Fräulein, bloß umgekehrt. Der Rücken ist gerade und der Sechel ist krumm. Sie seufzte. Chembruhu wird wissen, wozu er es gemacht hat. And they're talking here about um, Albert Abramovich, um, whom the narrator describes as having ein dunkles, östliches Knabenhaut mit schönen, traurigen Augen. Das hockte tief an die Schultern gedrückt, auf dem misswachsenen, mageren Leibe über den Buckel. Exactly. So here, um, women are being jealous of other women's beauty and the male attention. Um, again, the othering through she's not human, she's a child, almost like an animal. We hear Tia a lot. Um, and to, to draw back to that question that we'd heard at the beginning um, about the narrator and other characters in the village um, describing Susanna as inhuman and frightening. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to, at this point, you know, we're identifying what's going on. It's, um, uh, you know, 
she's being socially othered. We get it. We see some tropes with, you know, pity and with um, need for care and uh, these types of things. It's an unglück. But what effect does this have? I think I thought it was a very interesting question. What effect does the narrator's portrayal of Susanna have on the reader's perception of the narrator? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I'd invite you to unmute, unmute or share in the chat your thoughts on that question. Empathy. Interesting. Oh, uh, yes, someone wrote empathy and uh, Kai, go for it. <laughs> uh, so for me is like, because it's so overt and all of uh, the, uh, the way that they're othering her and the way that they're describing her as uh, like the, the author then, uh, author, sorry, the reader then cannot trust the narrator. And so you feel as though she's being quite misrepresented. And um, uh, for me personally, I haven't finished the story yet, but I did feel like a little bit angry <laughs> that they were so infantilizing to her, um, especially the narrator, because you, as a reader, you see the narrator as on your side, right? So the fact that, it, that they aren't then just kind of exacerbates these feelings. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. So a little bit, uh, a little bit angry or frustrated with the narrator, maybe. Definitely a valid response. Any other thoughts on how we are viewing the narrator uh, based on these observations? Laura. Uh, I think what comes through really, really well is that um, the narrator in the first part of the novel says uh, she's a teacher. She's not, not an artist, not a novelist, not a poet. And I think that comes through in the entire novel because she's very reliant on her duty as a teacher. I also think there's uh, there can be parallels drawn to to Koma's own life that I, wanna, I don't want to spoil it for anyone yet. Um, but it's always in that kind of observation position between some kind of um, some kind of awe and, and gaze towards the other and, and pity and empathy, but also being the, the narrative herself being stuck in her own ways of how she learned to, to act with children. She is a kindergartner, she is a teacher. So that's what she learned, that's what you need to do. And that's what she was hired to do. So she herself might not be able to, to break free of that um, kind of view that she has. Indeed. And the, the frame of reference that we're always trapped in our own frame of reference, I think it's very just indicative of the types of discourses that were circulating at the time, even the way Albert Abramovich is described. What, what does it mean to have, what was that quote again? Yeah, I, I don't I mean, what does that even mean, right? That there were certain discourses about, about race through uh, eugenics and people with disabilities. Um, they're, they kind of are reflecting, but again, as she's coming in here, how is that shaping the discourse as well? But yeah, any other thoughts? Uh, we have another, one more set of quotes to go through, but I didn't want to cut anyone off. If there's any more to say. Yes. Th thanks, Alec. Um, I, I was struck by the description of her, the reception of her that you highlighted by the men who position her as a sexual object or an object of pity, but also uh, particularly by the women who position her as a threat within a, within a sexual economy. And that to me then, uh, uh, you know, her, her uh, intellectual disability then being framed as a sign of an internal flaw. And we also then see that with uh, Rubin's mother that it's really, she is a hypersexualized woman. Uh, she is a threat to other normal, normal women in it. And uh, that is really, uh, that is expressed by, by her mental, dis uh, mental dis disability. Does that make any sense? That makes a lot of sense to me. Also this notion within the patriarchal structures that it's assumed that women are always fighting about male attention. Um, 
so very much within the sexual economy um, and her disability, you know, um, and we'll get, we're, we're about to come to some quotes by, but from Susanna herself or what Colmar has her say um, and contrasting how she perceives things, but it's, um, it's a different way and it doesn't make sense to the people in the village who have a very, you know, they have very narrow views about how people should be and she lives in another, um, she, she thinks differently and behaves differently and in ways that are then interpreted um, according to the narrow lens of the villagers, for example. So again, here's the last set of quotes. Now we're gonna look at um, Susanna herself um, and how Komar is um, developing this character and how you learn more and more, um, starting with, uh, we'll, we'll see that uh, the quotes start with the very small, start with her hands, start with her body, move then on to relationships. And actually the last one is quite philosophical. So let's just take, as we go through these, just take note of some differences between the quotes we saw previously and um, Susanna's self-statements, so to speak. Um, über sich selbst sagt Susanna, ich habe gar keine Hände. Sie, das sind Flügel, Möwen, Silbermöwen. Sie kommen weit her vom Meer. Ich bin doch ein Tier. And this is in response to um, the narrator saying, uh, du weißt viel von den Tieren, Susanna. Und dann sagt sie, ich bin doch ein Tier. But she also says, ich bin doch die Königstochter. Ich bin eine Tochter vom König David oder vom König Saul. Die lebten das ist schon lange her, aber wir haben es nicht vergessen. Aber die anderen vielen Leute stammen nicht von Königen ab, bloß ich, denn ich bin eine Jüdin. And then statements about her, her Erzieherin. Um, uh, one of the first things she says is, Du siehst anders aus, als ich dachte. Ich habe mir Bilder von dir gemacht, aber nun taugen sie alle nichts und ich muss sie wegwerfen. And also when she's talking about being Jewish, um, uh, the narrator admits that she is also Jewish. And Susanna responds, Du auch? Freust du dich sehr? And the narrator then reflects, uh, ich höre diese, heute diese Worte. Nein, ich freute mich nicht. Ich hatte vergessen. Ich war nicht stolz. Trug kein Zeichen des Königs des Schlechtes. Ich trug einen Makel. Recht klein war der Makel und störte mich wenig. Doch ich deckte ihn zu, wie es ging. And now, coming back to Aber Abramowitz, who, the bitch who seems to be maybe a little bit in love with uh, Susanna as well. Um, Susanna says about him, uh, Ach, das ist noch ein Junge. Aber ich mag ihn gern, wenn er auch hässlich aussieht. Als wäre nur sein Kopf ein Mensch und das andere nicht. Er ist sehr gefällig. And now she's speaking about um, Herr Rubin, who is her, um, her love interest. Uh, and she hears news, there's news from a Herr Rubin. And she says, ein Herr Rubin, ein Herr Rubin, ein Herr Smaragd, ein Herr Türkis, ein Herr Diamant. Lauter Herrn Edelsteine. Ein Edelstein ist es, meine Edelstein, mein Blutroter weil ich ihn liebe und er liebt mich. Finally, um, one of the most philosophical statements in the text uh, is spoken by uh, this character. Um, auch wenn es nicht in der Bibel genannt wird, ist es von Gott. Alles Geschaffene ist Gottes. Denn der Böse kann gar nicht schaffen, sondern immer nur alles verderben. Darum, wenn ein Geschöpf überhaupt da, da ist, ist es von Gott. Okay, so thinking about some of those differences, um, how she is thinking differently than the people around her and acting differently um, because of the, the, the way that she conceives those things differently. Um, one less to reflect for just a moment. Um, we can discuss this uh, open, you know, based on the words of the narrator, other characters, and Susanna herself. Just thinking about your own imagination as you're reading this text. How do you imagine Susanna's physical appearance? You know, she's super beautiful. We got. A description of her hair and her eyes. Um, but what image do you see in your head when you think of Susanna? And then also, how, how would you conceptualize or how would you put into language uh, her different way of thinking, communicating, and being in the world? We've had some suggestions from the villagers. Die uh, Irre, she's, uh, you know, no ein Kind, all of this. How would you, based on the evidence that we can find from the text, how would you understand 
how she looks and how she is. And then how do you interpret those representational choices? Why did we, we, we only have these uh, words that Coma has given us? How do you interpret those representational choices in light of how we, how we understand her? Let's take a minute to think about it. We can also do a breakout room at this time. I'm going to go ahead and put this question in the chat so that we can all see it. And I will do the breakout rooms. So just give you a moment to think about that question. I'll put you in a room with maybe two others, two or three others, to chat about it for five minutes, and then we'll come back. Okay, so I'll see you all back here um, in five minutes. So that'll be at 50, 53 or 54 after the hour or before the hour. Okay, go ahead and join the room when it pops up. Well, welcome back everyone. <laughs> Sorry if I cut you off there. <laughs> I hope you had some good uh, conversations about those representational choices what and what they mean. Um, here, here is some cover art from different uh, editions of, of, of Susanna. So you can see how some artists um, imagined her. Um, we have an actress on the right. In the middle, we have uh, a painting. And then we have this graphic on the, the, on the left, which I think is very interesting because Susanna, both faces are turned away from us. We don't get that information that we're maybe seeking. If anyone would like to unmute or share in the chat um, some of the things you talked about, go for it. Yes, uh, Beate, Gunda. Okay, on, in the picture on the left, she, she, she seems to me infantilized. I mean, she is held by the hand. She seems to be smaller. She seems to be kind of, um, well, it, it seems to be more a childlike representation. Whereas in the other two uh, images, she's quite self-asserting, I find. And, yeah. and maybe in the right one, she's maybe somewhat sexualized. I... Mm. Yes, I see that too, for sure. Again, the, um, these co this cover art is giving us more information than the text gives us, or it's trying to put in, into visual language what we have rendered textually uh, on the pages of the book. Um, is this what Susanna looked like in your mind, or maybe maybe a little different? And, and what about her internal life, her, her, her mind, her way of being in the world? What thoughts did you have about those things? Kai? Uh, yeah, we talked about how the first perception of her that you get before she starts like actually talking and showing how it how she actually thinks is that she's passive. But we also talked about how that's because of this entire like overwhelming press pressure for her to be passive. So like she doesn't get a chance um, in that beginning to like, or I guess like the the perception of her by others is also influenced by what they want her to be, and so. Yeah, we talked about how like this, of course, gradually changed uh, through reading of the book. I haven't finished it yet, but yeah, um, even through the, the little snippets and little bits that I've read, it's like, um, I just, yeah, there's a divide between what she actually is and what they want her to be. Indeed, in this world where she's, that she's living in her society is, thinking very much in categories with very specific expectations. And as you go along in the book, you, you just hear more from Susanna and you notice that for her categories are more fluid. Um, what's real, what's myth, um, 
what's an animal, what's a human. Um, she's very sensual as well. Laura had a comment. Oh, what I find really interesting is that although she's constantly being infantilized and being like, oh, she's mad, she, she's not sane, um, she speaks with such an eloquence and such a like, she, she is very poetic in her language and that speaks like that to me speaks like she must be very intelligent to even express herself that way. And still she is by society seen as a threat, mainly to herself because she, I think it might stem from the fact that she's being kept away and infantilized constantly that she really is the child that everybody wants to see her as, but I don't think she needs to be. I, I do suspect that if she wasn't so overprotected all the time she she might not be as as childish in, in a sense or as as aloof from the world as, as she's made out to be but i think kind of, it's it's more of a a symptom than a cause really yes very well put that her environment is disabling her whereas she probably could do a lot of things uh if she were only allowed to um to be herself okay um i want to keep us moving here um just i'm looking at the time um, and again, coming back to this um, issue of sexuality, uh, that there's a taboo of disabled people acting out their sexuality um, and having romantic relationships in general. Um, and again, to come back to something we discussed earlier, I mean, I suspect that um, her sensuality when she interacts with will be and they meet secretly at the window and, um, and she's like touching the hair on, on his chest and it, it's uh, very sensual. I think that, um, Maybe I suspect, you know, the way that this character is, she does not um, care so much for these uh, taboos in her society. So she is breaking with them. Um, it's very in line with who she is, and it's not um, it's not wrong or bad, but it's definitely understood that way. So to answer this question, I would say yes, <laughs> it does play a role in uh, Falwobin, who wanted her son to marry an upstanding, uh, proper young woman and he turned her down because he was in love with Susanna. So absolutely, she's thwarting these very, uh, I don't know, <laughs> maybe heteronormative or just uh, kind of the, the, the gendered um, the sexual economy. She's thwarting all of these mechanisms. And yeah, people say she's a Diona. So again, okay, right now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about, uh, talk about the how. We've been talking about the what quite a bit. So let's look at the how. How is this um, text? And I argued that in my article that we that Susanna is a text that encourages us to read ethically. What what do I mean by that, or how do I understand that? Typically, when we talk about um, witnessing something, we we say that only a person who was there and who saw or experienced events can um, claim to have witnessed them. And again, we're talking about time before. Uh, time before our time. <laughs> so we weren't there, but the text can help us, text can help us to um, have eyewitness accounts and all these things. Um, Primo Levi has pointed out how problematic this is when we're talking about groups um, like people with disabilities who were targeted um, uh, throughout the um, Nazi regime um, and other groups as well. So when we're talking about groups that were victimized, um, by that regime in light of the societal discourses of the time, um, it's problematic to talk about witnessing um, in, in the context of the Holocaust because eyewitnesses accounts, we can really only get those from perpetrators or from people who survived the camps. Um, so in, in, in other words, the victims who were killed cannot bear witness to their experience. Um, again, that's not exactly what's, the Holocaust isn't being depicted here, but it's definitely in the background. Um, I would argue. Susanna Knittel is a, another a Germanist who, who picks up on that theme and examines the case of persons with disabilities um, in the Holocaust. Um, and they were indeed the first victims um, of the Nazi regime, starting with the T4 um, euthanasia program in Berlin. So she's interested in um, this question of, of witnessing in the context of people with disabilities. Um, and her comment on this is very, it really struck me. You know, she said many people in this group, people with congenital um, uh, intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities, they could not have told their stories even if they had survived. Or, uh, so she's exploring 
because there's a there's a, uh, a lack of texts, uh, eyewitness accounts, she explores post-war texts and more recent portrayals of the experiences of persons with disabilities in search of a quote, productive engagement with the memory of euthanasia and its victims. So um, another um, uh, person who is looking at uh, reading ethically in the context of the Holocaust and, and these type of discourses that uh, dehumanize and marginalize people. Um, Sarah Liu uh, talks about what's called borderline reading, which is a mode of reading that tries to vicariously experience the Holocaust. Um, and it's unethical because it erases the identity of the victim, thus partly reenacting the perpetrator's insistence on defining the other in his own terms. So instead of this borderline reading, she encourages us to read illiterately. What does she mean by that? This would be an ethical mode of reading that acknowledges the difference between knowing about an event, like we know things about these events, um, but we acknowledge there's a difference between that and knowing something from personal experience. So it's a turning away from an aesthetics of wholeness and, and a complete understanding to an acceptance of partial answers and reading without identification. So always keeping things at a respectful distance and acknowledging you know what, I read about that, I read, um, I read accounts about it, I know a lot of information, but I don't really know. And this connects back to disability theory as well. Another um, theorist that I've really um, appreciated and I draw on his work uh, is the late uh, Tobin Siebers. He writes about disability aesthetics, um, as a ref um, which refuse to recognize the representation of the healthy body and its definition of harmony, integrity, and beauty as the sole determination of the aesthetic. Rather, disability aesthetics embraces beauty that seems by traditional standards to be broken, and yet it is not less beautiful, but more so as a result. So that's a lot of theory and some ideas, but to boil it down, um, what I'm arguing in the, in the article that uh, I wrote about this text um, is that Susanna is a portrayal of a disabled literary figure that invites readers to serve as vicarious co-witnesses for historical persons with disabilities who suffered discrimination and persecution. That we do not have, um, that this is a way for us to access it um, at a respectful distance. It's not connected to anyone's identity. Um, it's a fictional text, but it helps us to explore what were the conditions, what were the discourses that enabled um, dehumanization, marginalization, and ultimately the murder of people. So, and again, um, that Colmat is consistently, you know, pointing to experience and connecting that. There are a lot of biographical connections here. Um, that experience is a source of knowledge. And um, she has the governess, the narrator, state explicitly that she is writing about her experience and does not have all the answers um, that we might be seeking. Again, just as we can't see Susanna's face, we, we can't see a lot of things. Um, so our desire to fully grasp and, and identify with the experience of the main character, that gets thwarted. Um, and so it's leaving us uh, a little bit dissatisfied. Um, a full understanding of her story is going to be out of our reach. So there are these different ways that this happens throughout the text. Um, how does Susanna encourage us to read ethically? By creating the, that distance, that respectful distance. There's an ethical positioning of the narrator to Susanna. Again, she doesn't always know what's going on. And we see evidence of that in the text. Um, and, you know, this is a way for the author, Colmar, to position herself um, ethically toward the character of Susanna, which in turn positions us or encourages us to take up this position toward the, the protagonist. And by extension, or hopefully, this can lead us to um, have an ethical positioning uh, to persons with intellectual disabilities, just acknowledging we don't fully understand. Well, all we have is the information in the text, or when we're interacting with someone, um, we don't understand. And trying to force our lens, perhaps our normative, le normative lens, onto that person is going to create the type of othering that uh, we see um, Susanna experiencing in the text, and that does lead to her death. Uh, Michael Berlinger has a comment. No, I actually have a question, um, and that that actually relates 
uh, precisely to the death. Uh, on the one hand, Susanna, like so many uh, disabled characters, gets killed off. Right? It is uh, Dolmage's kill or cure. Either the disabled character gets cured or the disabled character gets killed. So this works very much within uh, normal disability mythology. But how would you how would you read that death, which is a which is strangely positioned in the text, within your um, scheme of reading and writing uh, from Comas' perspective, ethically? Does that question make sense to you, or do you want me to restate it? It does. It does make sense. I was almost disappointed at the end of Susanna when she died. And actually, the first time I read it, I wasn't quite sure that she had died. But then I, you know, was looking. I said no, and there was the begravenness. And okay, she she did die. She was hit by the train. She was following Rubin. Sorry, spoiler alert for those who haven't finished. <laughs> um, but there is some there, and there's confusion in how her death is framed. People said Geistesverwirrung, uh, Selbstmord. So there are again even in the death, it's about how that death is interpreted. And the narrator saying, ich wusste, dass es eine andere war. You know, she, she was going after Rubin. So I think that while it does align with that killer cure, that very familiar trope that we have, that myth, um, it's a little bit, uh, there's a little bit of nuance there. There are some questions that are raised um, focusing on the, in the interpretation of that death, how might we interpret that death? There's, there seems to be a question mark <laughs> that hangs at the end. Um, and I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> oh, it does. It does because I also felt uh, felt left hanging by the text. Uh, it doesn't encourage closure. Uh, and and I would actually very much read it with, within your uh, within your ethical framework, uh, because we do not know if it was Susanna's own agency uh, that brought her to the death, whether she did commit suicide, whether it was an uh, accident. But it also questions her agency and and reintegrates her into this whole helpless childlike thing that she doesn't know. There's a morning train that she takes the the. Um, uh, the agent's suggestion that you walk on the tracks seriously. So it, I find it leaves a lot of it open in the end. Indeed, absolutely. So thinking about the, this ethical positioning, you know, if we recall back to our very, our introductory exercise here, thinking about a disability text that shaped your thinking about disability, perhaps initially, um, thinking about the positioning in that text when you watch The Untouchables or when you read Heidi, you know, how is this positioning in, in Susanna of the literary figure, the narrator, the author, and us as readers, how is that similar to, or how is it uh, different than other disability texts you've encountered? Did this one feel different in any way to you, or did it seem to align with what you generally expect from a, um, a disability text? Feel free to type or um, un unmute. It has somewhat of the same feeling as the yellow wallpaper. I forgot the author of that short story, but it's about the mad woman in the attic kind of. Uh, but it's a it's a subversion of that. It's it's a horror basically, um, but it it's certainly it's like from the mad woman's perspective and how everyone around her seems to be going mad instead of her, um, and yeah. So that disconnect, I feel it there and here as well. Like um, that in this uh, uh, book, it, the focus is on Susanna. It is mostly on on her and it's, it's not like she's some secondary character somewhere even though the book is about her like that, that's happened so often right like that the the main character who is disabled is somehow a secondary character in their own story and so um 
I think that's that this happened or this book was written so long ago essentially it was a pretty long time and that it's still happening today and that uh, the civil characters are still not the main characters of their own stories I think that's really interesting that we already we did it you know like this is how it happened it existed that there was a disabled character that was in charge of her own story but then we still have some that are just not yeah that <laughs> persistence of the idea that the disabled character is just there for the i don't know the moral a moral test the edification of you know the, the real protagonist or something like this that they're just a a crutch in the way to use a disability metaphor yeah okay um i will i will move on if there are no more um comments here to talk about why is this important we've touched on this already and um and kai your comment ties ties in very nicely with this as well why are we why should we look at this old text it's very short it's you know um uh, but thinking about why is this important, you know, when, when we're talking about disability or any other um, marginalized kind of identity in a text, why should we, like the so what question, so why is Susanna, you know, I titled this presentation A, White, a Life Worthy of Living, so why is this text um, a text worthy of reading as we consider the ethical implications of writing and reading about disability? Just to bring these things together, again, just to raise maybe more questions and answer to answer that question. So there's a question of authenticity and the authorship of dis disability text today. Um, so knowing, for example, that Coma was not a person with disability, uh, with a disability um, per se, um, maybe, we don't know, <laughs> but we do know that she um, suffered under sexist and uh, racist uh, structures. So again, raising a question about how authentic is this, is we should care about the authorship, um, to take it seriously as a disability text. We're calling to mind some things we just talked about, that there are, there's a lack of first person accounts by people with disabilities of their persecution under the Third Reich. So was this, is she telling someone else's story? Is it her story to tell? Is she trying to give a, an honest account of someone that she actually knew? Maybe she knew a person like that. Um, and of course, um, as, as was just mentioned, that there is a, a persistence of oppressive structures that marginalize and delegitimize the existence of persons, especially with intellectual disabilities um, and their experiences. So that infantilizing uh, that those intersections with, with uh, gender, sexuality, and race are there as well. And they have real consequences, right? Although these things are con constructs, they have real consequences for people. I found this uh, this quote, and again, this is how it begins. And I think Lava mentioned this, uh, Ich bin keine Dichterin, nein, which is the opening line of, uh, of Susanna. Wenn ich eine Dichterin wäre, würde ich eine Geschichte schreiben. Eine schöne Erzählung würde ich schreiben mit Anfang und Ende aus dem, was ich weiß. Ich bin keine Künstlerin, Nur eine alte Erzieherin mit grauen Scheitel, zermürbter Stirn und Tränesäcken unter den müden Augen. Ihre Stirn war so glatt und schimmernd wie Kugeln von Elfenbein. And then a little bit later we hear, um, Dichter müssen sich bemühen, die Gründe der Handlungen aufzuhören. Das Leben spart sich die Mühe und lässt seine Gründe im Dunkeln. Und was ich hier aufschreibe, ist erlebt. So how do we take this? It's a fictional story, again, is it based on someone that Koma actually knew. What is, is she the narrator? What is going on here? Uh, Michael Berlinger has a question or comment. Uh, it, uh, since we're moving to the to the last few minutes of, of the seminar, I wanted to pick up on this, Alec, uh, this whole question of the ethical reading and, uh, and exploded a bit, uh, you know, because one of my key questions in, in having a seminar such as ours is the power differential and the knowledge differential. Uh, and that's why we started the series with a speaker on lived ability, uh, uh, lived experience and disability, exactly giving this kind of epistemological insight uh, into 
into the experience, the lived experience, and then we moved on to, to representation and, uh, and tropes and so on. Uh, but for me, the question is, you did a great job in, uh, in showing how Colma explodes the text. And that's also, I think, on a narrative level of, of bringing indeterminacy in, in, in unsettling our uh, need for closure and knowing and exactly being able to put it into our little schubladen. Uh, so my question to you now is, uh, what is our ethical position in, uh, in running such a seminar and deconstructing dominant discourses on disability, but not this not being taught by a person with a disability and you writing on a text like you know what what is our positioning we can't we can't declare ourselves as allies that is just that is a no a no go so and i've been struggling with this you know can i do this can i not do this is this okay is this not okay uh, what, is, what is my ethical position as a teacher? I'm sorry to explode your entire entire thing here. I, I was just wondering if you had given this any thought. I have, so not in, not in the least. That is a wonderful way to, I think, to end this here. Um, I would give the same answer to, um, you know, white folks who are struggling with, um, you know, I, I want to be a white anti-racist and struggling with that I'm white, can I be anti-racist? Um, how can I participate in that work? Um, men who are, uh, you know, uh, feminists. Can you be a male feminist? Um, I think the answer is yes, because um, you know, rights are taken away from people based on uh, based on these myths and these tropes about disability, um, or people are denied their their full humanity and their rights. And and um, these things are not given. They have to be uh, collective actions needed you know, uh, to stand up. So we need to, um, as folks who are temporarily able-bodied, because we're all, it's, disability is gonna be a part of everyone's experience if we live long enough. Um, it's, in our, it's in our own interest as well. Um, so disability is, uh, um, again, I wouldn't say, again, of course I would defer, you know, to, to someone's experience here and I think um, I think this is what Colmar is doing to urging us to value experience and to value um, knowledge based on experience uh, instead of from the outside. So I think that it, it's an important reflection for us all to participate in. And yes, we can. We need to break these things open and we need to attend to how is how are these how are these things still. Uh, persisting in our society today, although the world has changed so much, how are people being um, denied access? How are they being disabled? Uh, when I'm teaching, <laughs> is my pedagogy accessible? <laughs> Am I valuing different ways of being in the world? Is everyone's voice heard? So I think that for all of us that might come into our experience and our practice, whatever we're doing in different ways. I don't know if that answers your question, but those are my thoughts on that. Thank, uh, thank you, Alec. I think it's actually uh, a great way of, of, of wrapping it up. Uh, it, is, it is a difficult situation because if you are like me, if you were brought up in the structuralist and post-structuralist way of thinking, then, uh, then the epistemological advantage of lived experience is questionable, right? The author is dead. Yeah. Uh, but, but it is really, really hard when you engage with something like disability uh, uh, theory and critical disability studies to to keep that position because it denies lived experience. It uh, uh, it just it just stays with the social construct, and uh, and particularly with with issues of disability, uh, issues of pain, uh, for instance cannot cannot be denied and i mean as as my seminar knows i try to open every single session with a a very current example of how these discourses play out in our everyday lives and today you all know it's in paddy's day and we had the example that the police cut off uh, cordoned off uh, ezra street with barriers that are 
bolted into the streets. Uh, what they forgot is that people live there, including a person with a disability who could no longer get through with a wheelchair. So this is where ableist discourses have a direct impact and a continuous impact as we are thinking only from an ableist, uh, an able-bodied perspective. Okay, well, thank you, Alec. That was a pleasure to work with you again. Uh, I, would like, uh, I would like to encourage everybody uh, to come to the last uh, instance of our seminar. We are gonna have a young Austrian author uh, who, who has written a, um, a story that prominently features and uh, a character with a disability. So we will have gone full circle. We will have started with a, with a person talking about lived, uh, lived experience. We, are, we then went to a theoretician who, who uh, introduced us to the different disability myths. Now we had a literary scholar who analyzed the text for us. And the last step is then to have a creator, an artist who created uh, um, a, uh, uh, who created a text uh, about disability. And I'd be very interested to ask, uh, to ask her the same question. Uh, this will be a reading with, uh, with questions. This, uh, the next one will not be a seminar per se. So it will be more like a traditional author reading. And if, if this uh, awful pandemic has done one positive thing, it has given us the ability to bring people in from far from far away, she will be talking to us from Berlin. Alec is speaking with us uh, from uh, from Texas, and despite the time difference and everything, it is so lovely uh, to to be able to to include all these aspects here. So I thank you very very much, Alec, and I thank everybody for coming for participating so actively. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>